Welcome back to another episode of Season 5 of the RAG Podcast. As you guys know by now, this is the number one podcast across the recruitment sector globally. And we've always been on a mission to help recruitment agencies grow by interviewing founders and telling their stories of success from startup all the way to scale up and exit. Well, this season we're a little bit different. How do you as a recruitment leader and founder maintain your family and friendships whilst being the best person at work? How do you stay physically fit mentally and emotionally? And how do you find time for yourself in the madness? How do you find time for self-interest, for hobbies and self-improvement? Well, to help you with this, I'm going to be interviewing someone every single week that can demonstrate experience in one or more of these areas. So I'm going to talk to recruitment founders and also some experts from outside the industry who can deep dive into things like relationships and health and well-being. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the RAG Podcast. On this week's episode, I am joined by Nada Bashara. Nada is a co-founder and director of Ingham Jones, who are a specialist financial services, risk, technology, and compliance recruitment search firm. So a boutique firm that launched in the pandemic. Nada is someone that I've had communication with over the last couple of years. And uh, really, I wanted to interview Nada because I get a lot of requests from people who say, Sean, it's all well and good interviewing the guys that have been going for years, that are looking at scale and exit, but they want more stories of recent startups. Now, Nada started in, in November 2020. So if you remember, that was when the UK went back into lockdown. We came out in the summer of 2020. We then went back in in November. We came out a little bit in December. We went back in at Christmas. We didn't come out till April. So it's right in that heart of the second lockdown, the second wave, if you like. Now, um, in 18 months, he's managed to produce a business with 10 staff that have achieved financial targets, headcount targets, they've surpassed their expectation. And he's doing he's done it with a really relaxed and, and pragmatic approach. What I love about Nader is he's, he's super chilled. You know, you can see he's, he's ambitious, he's energetic, he's got... Um, He's got things moving in the right direction, but he's doing it in a way that that, that works for him. And he's he's not getting too excited or too carried away. He's not trying to grow for the sake of growth like other people will. He's not he's not a, kind of bowing to his ego around that. He's just doing the right things in the right order. And he's got a cracking business that he's built in in some of the most difficult times we could have ever have imagined. So for anyone who's thinking about starting up an agency or in the really early days, this episode is going to be one for you. So without further ado, Nada, welcome to the RAG Podcast. Thanks, Sean. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Pleasure. I'm just, I'll be honest, I'm looking at the background of your room thinking it looks so much better than mine. Like the, the, <laughs> the blue and the pictures and the books, you, it looks very, is that home or is that the office? It's at home. It's at home. So during the pandemic, it's obviously when we started the business, I worked at home full time and yeah. my business partner and I worked from our living room, but my wife had enough of it. So she thought, why don't I just decorate the spare room? Yeah. And then it's a nice enough place for you to work. Just yeah, trying yeah. to get me out of the It looks good. Room. I like the paintwork. You've done it well. Like mine, this is my home as well. I've got an office down the road, but today I always prefer the podcast at home, really, because the sound quality is better. <laughs> um, but people think I'm in a cupboard. They're like, you know, <laughs> it looks so small. If you actually, if I move my, like, you can see the room is bigger than than this area. But yeah, yeah <laughs> I need to maybe paint it or do something. It's a bit dull. But, I quite like it. It looks like a studio, more like yeah. a studio. Like. It's not. It's just a spare bedroom. <laughs> Um, well, look, Nada, I've done a, I've done a brief introduction, mate, and uh, I wanted to, uh, I, I can never do it justice, right? I, you know, you, can you do us a favor? Don't, we'll go into the past in a minute, but just if someone says like, who are you and what do you do right now? How would you describe it? Um, so I'm Nada. I'm one of the co-founders and directors of Ingham Jones. Ingham Jones is a financial services risk, a technology and compliance uh, recruitment search firm. Mm -hmm. um, we help leaders across financial services in the UK, Europe and North America, find talent, build teams, hire leadership um, into their companies. Um, and we've been around for just under two years now. Amazing. And you launched in the pandemic? Launched in the pandemic um, in, well, in and around my dining room table uh, with my <laughs> business partner. Um, so it was November the 2nd, uh, we launched the business. Wasn't that when we went back into lockdown? 
the first yeah, yeah, yeah. we were back in because I'd just moved to Manchester in the oct- I moved October 16th and I moved to this flat with like its own gym and football pitch and all these cool mm-hmm. facilities. And then on November the first, we were like, Yeah, it's all shut. <laughs> I was like, Yeah, I'm spending all this money to fucking live in a in a box flat with no no facilities. So <laughs> I remember that time really, really well. I do. Everything was shut. There was nothing to do. So when we were working 24-7, it's not like we were missing out on anything. We weren't missing out on social activity, no. you know, partying or anything. Everything was fully locked down. We just had five days at Christmas, I think, to see family or something like that um, at that time. But it was that day, wasn't it? It was that year where I think we were allowed to meet a few. It was like we all the way up, everyone was building up to Christmas. And then Boris was like, no, we can only meet a certain amount. Yeah, we came out of lockdown in the December. We went through that really ridiculous substantial meal period do you remember yeah um i went down to london with my team and i remember we went to a pub and we had like honestly like loads of starters with one pint then we went to another <laughs> place and then we went for a meal in an indian and then we went out to a, for a bar for some cocktails and we had to eat we ate like five meals i was like this is disgusting i know it was such a weird period i mean i liked parts of lockdown the isolation is helpful to kind of reflect and just spend time you know but it was weird when we came out of it. It was uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, we, we set up at that time. I think at that time it was full lockdown. And then, like you said, that Christmas we had a couple of days. But we weren't missing out on anything. You know, lots of businesses were struggling at the same time. Yeah. So when we set up, it was almost equal footing. Uh, yeah, and it, and it, but the economy was pretty good. I remember, like, it didn't... January that year, even though we didn't come out of lockdown until April, it was booming. Like, there was... People were doing deals left, right and centre. So in a way, do you think it was a good time to start your business? Yeah, I did. I mean, to be honest with you, we I, we started it at that time for several reasons, but we didn't actually think economically this is the best time. It wasn't like a stroke yeah. of genius or predicting economic forecasts. That's why we started it. We started it because we were both supposed to get married that year and we both had our weddings cancelled due to COVID. Right. So all that planning, all that anticipation for it was gone. And it was like, there's no better time. It's a quiet period in our lives. We always want to do it. Um, it's tough. There is a lot of hiring freeze still. The economy might pick up, but again, that would just be pure speculation. So it was just sitting down, discussing it and thinking, right, let's just do it. Uh, we've got a year until, you know, our, was you know we postponed our weddings. Both Jermaine and I would get married, not to each other. We did that in November, but <laughs> to, um, our respective partners. And so we just pushed it forward a year, the wedding. And so you both got married in November this last year. No, we both got married in July last year. Um, Right. How far apart? uh, Twelve days apart. (laughs) Wow, that must have been a hectic period trying to like who was whose was first. It was Jermaine's first, um, and then he went off on his honeymoon, and then it was mine. So yeah. Was he back for your wedding though? Yeah, yeah, it was back for my wedding. It's got to be there, right? It's got to be there. Yeah. So let's go back. Let's go back. We'll get to the business and all this soon but i looked into you and obviously you you did a, you got a first class law degree is that right yeah so why on earth are you in recruitment now why are you not like harvey specter and like winning, <laughs> winning major lawsuits for like companies but why are you not why are you not finding out what's been going on with boris johnson and sorting out party gate what's going on <laughs> i am sure and i do that in the evening <laughs> <laughs> um no basically i i studied law i really enjoyed studying law um and then i went to practice it and i did a short stint as a paralegal um and that's that was completely different studying it you know just actually doing these seats it was completely different um i'd say i enjoyed it a lot more than practicing it i I found practicing it kind of didn't utilize you know my my skills professionally as much which is like you know i really enjoyed relationship management i really enjoyed sales meeting people speaking with people all that kind of thing um and it was a lot more administrative it was a lot more kind of strict and staggered in terms of the progression cycle of a typical solicitor having to do two years four years five years um and i had a couple of friends in recruitment jermaine funnily enough was one of them and he was in there before me and it just seemed like the kind of business where or the kind of industry where you can go in you can learn the craft and then if you do well, you can progress at a much more rapid pace. You can earn quite a lot at a young age. Um, I, you know, I, I enjoyed spending money. I enjoyed holidays, cars, all the things that a young 20 year old chap would enjoy. So I thought uh, before I commit to a training contract and then be pigeonholed into a, a life of, of legal practice, 
let me give recruitment a go. It doesn't work out. I can always go back, do my LPC yeah. and then train as a solicitor. Uh, so I joined recruitment within the first year. Loved it. Commission was great. You, you went know, to Gro Groveland, was it? Groveland's, yeah, Groveland's. What an incredible a well -known, place. Quite a well-known yeah. place in Brighton, isn't it, to go to? Yeah. I mean, it, at the time, it was the, the best recruitment firm in Brighton. Um, it was going from strength to strength. Uh, they hired really ambitious, kind of like-minded people. It was a great team that I worked with. I learned so much from the leaders there, uh, Ben Wilson, David Lean. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they were just it was just a great place to start, really. And I, was, I suppose I was fortunate in that sense because you hear the horror stories of so many recruiting businesses where people go into it and it's like, oh, no, this is not what I want to do. So it helped me kind of think, you know what, this is a great industry. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed it, did well, and stayed, stayed there ever since, really. Amazing. So... You, you you did have a move around in your career, though, didn't you? You didn't stay at Groveland's right. So, so how did the career evolve as, a, as an actual agency recruiter? Yeah, so, um, right, so I was in Groveland's for a couple of years, and then I was about to move to Singapore. Um, I applied for a role out there. One, one of my best friends lives out there. Um, and it took a while to get an EP granted, so it's an employment pass, which you have to get to be allowed to work in Singapore um and then as soon as i got my ep granted that's when i rekindled my relationship with my now wife um right. we met out and it was kind of like right i either stay here and see how this relationship goes or i just knock it on the head and, and move to singapore decided to stay we're now married as, as you know Good choice. Uh, Good choice. <laughs> and Very as well. i decided to stay i thought right what can i do now i need to get i need to get a job back in brighton where i live so you'd and actually I, quit and was ready to go and everything? Oh, yeah, yeah I quit. I was ready. The bag was packed, more or less. Oh, wow. Uh, to speak. So I was like, right. What you ever, I... like, fallen out of there and thought, I wish I'd have gone to Brighton? <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Yeah, no, don't I... admit that. Don't admit that. <laughs> no, I don't. Can we cut that out? Yeah. Um, no, not at all. But it was, yeah, obviously it was a great decision. But at the time, I, I was torn. You know, I, I could could have gone back to Groveland's. I would have just had to, you know, reach out and then rejoin. But... I had quite an elaborate leaving do, so it would have been awkward to just walk back into the office a few weeks <laughs> later. Yeah. I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. After all the tears, don't worry. Did I'm everyone still like? Did everyone think though? Like, what is this guy playing at? Like, massive leaving party. He's off to Singapore, <laughs> and then he's just on the, he joins a competitor or something. Yeah. Well, the, my manager at the time, Sean, he was he was asking me the same kind of thing, um, but yeah, no. So I ended up just joining another recruitment company in, in Brighton. Uh, stayed there for a few years. And then towards that part of it, I started like falling out of love with recruitment, the whole 360 uh, work cycle. So I went internal um, for a little while, joined a, an amazing company called Jellyfish, mm -hmm. um, which is a digital marketing organization. Just I was one of two uh, internal recruiters there at the time trying to help kind of create that function. Now they've grown to a company of a thousand people and they've got an, wow. an entire a recruitment team. But at that time, it was just experiencing what the other side was like. And although I realized it wasn't for me and I enjoyed the commercial aspect too much, I learned so much from that period um, as to how they interact with agencies, what what it's like to be within a HR team in an organization as opposed to agency life. So it was a useful learning curve, but I, I rushed back into agency. Um, Stay there for a few more years, and then... what was the, what was wrong with internal? You said you mentioned it before, administ a bit like the law again, a bit administrative. Yeah, exactly that. It was what I was trying to get away from. Um, I, I like the kind of the commercial element of an agency too much. Um, I think I like... I'm the same. You know, I think that yeah. that's the bit that I love more than anything is marketing agency, recruitment agency. Like you're 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 you've got to be so commercially focused, and yeah, losing that would I don't think I can handle losing that. No, exactly. And I and I lost that completely. And it was, you know, 80% administrative. And it was just, yeah, it, it didn't suit my personality. It didn't suit what I wanted to do long term either. So yeah, although it was different, and it was a great company, I just wanted to rush back into an, an agency environment. So you went back to the business you'd worked with before? Yeah, I went back to well, yeah, I started interviewing around. Um, and I interviewed with so many businesses. And Got a few offers, but I just, you know, you know, and you just don't really trust the leadership that you're about yeah. to kind of go work for. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And in my mind, it was like better the devil, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I went back uh, purely because of that reason. And where um, was Jermaine at this point? Jermaine was still at Groveland's. So he'd stayed there the whole time. 
GTA stay there the whole time. Right. Um, he was doing really well. He was obviously getting headhunted all the time. But, you know, he's, when you were doing really well in recruitment, especially part of his role was contracting. So building up a contract book, you're going to well, be headhunted. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I always found it quite funny. I was like, you know, when I was at my peak billing 60 grand a month on my own and then had a team doing the same, I'm like, why am I going to leave? Like, mm. do you know what I mean? Like, what? And I got on really well with the team. So I used to get messages every day off Rector Rex and other owners. And I was just, I thought, no. Like, yeah. and then there was one at one, I remember having an argument or like a pretty shit day with my bosses. And then I did go out and meet one client once and, mm. uh, well, one, sorry, one potential, one potential employer once. And I remember as soon as I met him, I was like, I felt dirty. I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> it was, it was towards the end anyway. I knew I was going to launch my own business at that point. So yeah. it was more, but I thought, what's the point in leaving here? I'm going through all that shit to join another one. So then I have to leave and start my own from them. Like, isn't, I'm just going to stick it out. So, yeah. But yeah, I uh, I can imagine how Jermaine went on. So, so you go back to the better the devil you know, and then and then tell us where did when when what, what where, where were you when the pandemic hit? Was it were you with that business? Yeah, yeah, was it with the, with that business? Uh, we working from home. You know, they were trying to figure out the work from home, come to the office situation um and you've been in recruitment what six years at this point or something so you know you yeah about, about six years yeah six years yeah. coming on to seven years um but for the most part for the five years of it i was full 360 um so bringing in my own clients managing the accounts and, and delivering on it um and i've always had a desire to set up my own business i was you know i was going to do various other things before i set up with a recruitment company just because i've always been kind of i've always had that entrepreneurial mindset of just creating something um and then when the kind of the stars aligned i was like well recruitment is where i actually have most of the experience so it yeah made where, sense. Where, where where do you think your entrepreneurial mindset comes from um i'm not sure to be honest i think just generally i like the freedom of it i like the freedom element i think even in even in any role i've had as an employee when i had the freedom and the reins to kind of run my own desk properly that's when I was most successful and most productive. Um, so I think that's the part of it. And then alongside it, it's just creating something. Whenever you join a team, even as a manager, you, the culture is still embedded within a company. But to create a culture, um, that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to create a culture that was aligned with my beliefs and what I wanted as well, which is around autonomy, performance, um, productivity, um, and that kind of thing. So. I've always read lots of self-help books. Um, I just love reading semi-biographical self-help books and, you know, hearing inspirational stories. So having grown up doing all of that, I just thought, right. Were you surrounded by any other entrepreneurs, parents, family, friends? Did you, did you know any? Yeah. So, yeah. So my dad, my dad was an entrepreneur uh, for a while. He was originally um, a university lecturer for a number right. of years. Um, and then he's, he, he had a computer science degree and he set up his own computer shop back in the day. Wow. Um, but a lot of my friends are as well, to be fair. A lot of my close friends are either self-employed, they either run their own business, whether it's a sole trader or, you know, a limited company with 10 or 15 people. Um, so, yeah, speaking to them and how they live their life, how they manage their days, it always seemed appealing to me. Um, but, yeah, I did learn a lot from people as well. Yeah, I think I was the opposite, you know. I didn't have anyone around me. My stepmom, actually, my dad got with when I was like 16, 15, 16. She was an entrepreneur. She had her own cleaning business. Mm. And uh, I think she was the first person I saw who'd done quite well. And But again, I didn't feel inspired by her. I didn't feel like, oh, I want to be like, I don't know. I just didn't, it didn't really go in my mind. I, I just wanted to make some money. I remember yeah. I wanted to make money, but I didn't know. It took me a lot longer, I think, than a lot of people to be want to want to be. And I didn't start my business till I was thirty. You, what were you when you started yours? Like twenty seven, twenty eight? No, no, I was thirty one. Thirty one, right? Yeah. So similar experience there. Then I'm interrupting this episode to bring a message from one of our sponsors, Vincere, who um, they're quite similar to Hoxo, I believe. What I love about Vincere is I think we've got very similar visions on the way we do things and. You know, we do a lot of sharing about customer stories and successes, and I think they've they've tried to really share why you should pick them as a business through their customers rather than just talking for the sake of talking. So, what I've been checking out recently, if you go on their YouTube channel, type V I N C E R E on YouTube and have a look at what they've been doing, you'll notice that they've been sharing stories 
from their community on a weekly basis. And it, what's amazing about this is that the customers have been raving about things like ease, ease of use, configurability, because look, we're not techies in recruitment for fuck's sake. There's a reason we are in recruitment. It's because we're probably not the most technical minded in many senses. But Vincere's tool actually is, you know, it's configurable for most people. Um, and they've got all these features now from, you know, video interviewing, all these different areas that they're trying to bring in so that you don't really need to invest in other tech platforms. You can have a one-stop shop solution that will give you everything. Um, but don't just take Vincere's word for it. Watch their YouTube channel, find out what their customers think. I have found it really interesting and uh, it's been awesome. So check out Vincere on YouTube um, and everything's on there. So... All right, let's go back then. So you're in the pandemic. Mm. Were you living with your wife at this point? Yeah. But, fiance, right? You you plan to get married. Mm. What went through your mind when 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 March and April unfolded? And were you on furlough? How how did how were you treated? What what went on? Yeah. So March and April hit, and the company I was at they they made a few redundancies. Um, people who just joined, and obviously there wasn't that workflow there, and you know, mm. it was that period of time. Um, we stayed on, so Jermaine was at the same company. Um, so he's moved me. over to join you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I pulled him over to join me there, and yeah. yeah, we, you know, we both stayed on. Tried to kind of support the company get through that period, um, and it was just yeah, lots of hiring freezes and things like that. Working from home, and like I said, lots and lots of time to reflect on what I actually want to do it as a career moving forward. Um, listening to the Rag podcast as well during that time <laughs> had it on in the background well we, um, we went we went daily didn't we so there was enough fucking there was enough yeah exactly <laughs> there was enough to listen to <laughs> no there certainly was yeah and i had that on in the background whilst working from home and a lot of the stories to be fair from that really inspired me as well i was you know hearing people that have actually done it within the last couple of years what they've experienced what mm. they've gone through um and i really like the fact that it was really refreshingly honest you know it's not all uh it's not all rainbows and butterflies it's actually real life issues that they face straight away and even down the line when they're successful so it was mad because i went from interviewing like you know really cool founders in person in the office and most of the stories whilst they were honest they were still worse stories of, of of success right yeah to sitting there in in the spare room in my flat at the time in london on this shitty, uh, this shitty little microphone. I think the first episode I was using my headset. I didn't even have a microphone. Didn't own a microphone that you could plug into a laptop. It was all done in the studio. Um, and I remember like I had Greg Savage and I had Joe Mullings and I had James Osborne and I had some big hitters and David Higgins who founded Harvey Nash. And we all gravitated to the to the to the G, the global financial crisis and what went on then. As but genuinely, I mean, I, I was worried and I think everyone was worried and there was a genuine like everyone was everyone was really human in that moment like there was none of this like bragging about how good your business is it was fucking right try this yeah. try that i'm doing this i'm worried about that um i'm really proud of the fact we did that because it, you know it, i think it kept me going it kept yeah. me going you know it gave me a gave me a gave me a really clear focus because we weren't doing any deals either it wasn't like we were making any money at that point um so i'm really happy it helped so when when did you and jermaine decide it was you know you're gonna go for it when did you already know when he joined the business that that was was that the plan or no not at all really um no i i was thinking of leaving the business um and i i, I was thinking of setting up and or or even joining somewhere else interviewing but just through various conversations just speaking about it you know we were friends outside of work so just discussing it um talking about it and then eventually we're like right let's just do it you know we're at this stage and yeah there wasn't much much more to it than that, to be honest. I'd love to give you a creative story as to how, what inspired us to do it, but it was just a few conversations here or there. <laughs> and then how long between those conversations and actually quitting your jobs and going for it? Uh, not that long, actually. It was about a month. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was a big I risk. That's quite a good thing. I mean, me and Amma probably spent two years. And in a yeah. way, that might be why we didn't actually launch the recruitment company, because we spent so much time analysing <laughs> it that yeah. I ended up probably talking myself out of it and thinking, I want to do something else. Um, I'm glad we've done what we've done now. I wouldn't change yeah. it. But yeah, I can almost think that short period of just, fuck it, let's go. Yeah, exactly. It's like a fail fast mentality, because yeah. worst case scenario, we give it a go for six months. That's what we set up. But you know, when we created the initial 
strategy and like plan for the business. It was a six month plan. We want to do this much within six months. When these kind of clients create this kind of presence and build these figures, if we do it great, we can carry on for a further six months. Let's not overthink it. Let's not cry and try and create something like, you know, we didn't envisage within the first year and a half, we'd have a team of 10 and an office and, and, and roles around the world. But at the time, all we wanted to do was to get through that quarter, get through that's, that. Quarter. You know what? That's a really, I, I spoke to some, well, one of my recent episodes, those you, the, the rec hub, and they, they had a 72 page business plan before they started. <laughs> so they're the opposite. Of you. I didn't have a business plan. It was like back of a fag packet shit. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you know, you, at least you had a six month plan. You knew roughly what you wanted to do. We, <laughs> we didn't have any projections, any numbers whatsoever. Yeah. We just said, look, and especially when we launched a marketing business, it was like, hmm. The only reason we knew it had worked is because we sold five contracts within four weeks and we were yeah. like, oh shit, there's something in this. So we went to like 10 grand a week to, in no, 10 grand a month because we were selling it for two grand a month at the time, our, our services. And we, we got it in like four weeks. We were like, wow. Like, so we've just put 120 grand in the business if we can carry this on. And that was what gave us that kick. But yeah, exactly. And there was no restrictive covenant. You know, it was totally different. I could just go. Um, yeah. And I didn't fancy that. But so what was it like then? You you obviously postponed your weddings. You yeah. said you worked from home. Did you have a um did you have a covenant period you had to be careful of? Yeah, you... yeah, yeah. We had a six months restrictive covenant, which we adhered to. You've got um, to. You've got to. Yeah, yeah. We see so it was all completely new business for six months. Um, which is fine. I, I really enjoyed that's probably my favorite part of the role, it still is. Um yeah, so, same. Yeah, and Jermaine is also very good at it. We're both you know successful 360 consultants so we we believe we can do it from scratch anyway um so yeah we went off we had a list of clients we wanted to bring on that we hadn't worked with before in the previous company um and then once we got a couple of on and a few relationships opened up i think our first role ironically was actually in singapore <laughs> which wasn't where we tried to kind of win business but it just that's where the referral led to in the end yeah um, but then once you get like you said once you get that first placement as a new business it gives you the confidence the courage to just carry on and see where it can take you um but yeah it was all new business for the first six months and then after six months it, clients we've worked with in the past started reaching out they wanted to work with us again um, what was it really like though like you sat in your house yeah and you are doing it for you you've got no database you've got no like you've got you, you you've got what's genuinely what's it what goes through your mind on Day one, two, three, when, you, when you're staring at your screen thinking, this is fucking real now. Do you know what? It was almost like, don't stop until you get a result out of the day. doesn't matter what the result is. Because um, in the first week, like I said, you don't have a database. You don't have a presence. You don't have anything, really, at all. Your terms of business are just about written up, but you have to yeah. rejig it about 10 times, depending on the conversation you have. So it was every day, you know, Jermaine, and I, Jermaine used to come to my house at 5.30 a.m. Wow. Um, We'd have a coffee. We'd start work at 6 a.m. He'd leave it around. Your, what was your missus seven. saying about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, was, she was upstairs. She was in this room, actually. Yeah. And we were downstairs in the dining room. Um, and then luckily, they're, you know, they're far enough apart that we, it was, we weren't disturbing each other. I got in trouble on Sunday this week, right? So I got I, I, my mate Keith and I go running a lot. So I've been doing this running every day challenge this year. I'm still doing it. I started in January. I've had, I've had nine days off due to injury. Um, is it nine? Yeah, one week and two days due to different things. So nine days off. So I'm on 138 days today, I think, this year I've been running. Anyway, Sunday, we go and do this early 12K. So I got up at half six, but I need my watch to to use it. So I get up and lot, the kids are at the step, at the dad, sorry, I'm the stepdad. Um, Lauren's in bed and then I get up and she's got this habit of switching the plugs off at night. So my watch and my phone are dead. Oh, no. it just so happened I woke up because I'm in this habit of waking up and I've not been drinking either. So my, I feel really fresh. Yeah. And I'm like, Lauren, why'd you turn that off? Like, I've got no, like, so now I'm like, I've got to get in the car. It's probably 10 minutes and try and get enough charge on my watch at least. Just because <laughs> I like tracking my runs. Yeah. Anyway, I got, I got a text off her when I, when I got to the run saying, never wake me up at half six like that again. I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, she's she's already like, why are you getting up at that time on a Sunday? You're a lunatic. <laughs> I imagine you getting up at you having your colleague, your business partner, come on at five a.m. or whatever. Yeah, what was that? And then it's what are you doing at six? Who the hell are you ringing at? <laughs> what <are> you doing? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good point. Um, but are you ringing just... in Singapore or something, or was it just messages on LinkedIn? 
No, it was just messaging on LinkedIn. So obviously doing business development, you try and catch the MDs, the CEOs of businesses. And what I found worked most of the time and what happened with their schedule was they'd start work really early. Mm. So that they, lots of like partners, MDs or CEOs of businesses, they start work at like 7, 7.30. Yeah. Yeah. But the rest of the team, they don't start until 9. So from that 7 to 9 period, that's when you can get hold of them. Yeah, and if you can, you know, call them or message them or reach out at that time, you're more likely to get a, get a reply. Yeah, yeah. So that's what that period of the day was, from like six a.m. to nine a.m. It was kind of pure business development, and then following on from that, it was just delivering on opportunities. You know, speculatively sending CVs, reaching out to you know the contacts that we had in our network, that kind of thing. Really, just having conversations for the rest of the day. Um, but we tried to make sure at the end of every day, one of us got some sort of result, um, whatever it may be. If it's a meeting, a conversation, if it's an interview, we just had to get a result. Was it a job driven? Was it a job driven market for you rather than a candidate driven market? At the beginning? It was it was starting to become a job driven market, but we had this really strong network of, of great candidates that then when we spoke to them, they were happy to kind of explore new opportunities. So. A were you allowed of, to do that in your in your covenant? Were you allowed to talk to candidates that you knew? Yeah, well, it was candidates that they weren't candidates of the old business. They were just yeah. candidates in the network that someone I might yeah. have spoken to like five years ago, but has no association yeah, yeah. with the previous company. Um, well, I think that's a really tricky thing, isn't it? Like, I remember reading my contract and it's like, any candidate you've dealt, I'm like, how the hell do I know what's on that database? <laughs> yeah. I ain't got a clue. And I think, I don't know how, how, how much a company could enforce that because it's like, yeah. I, and, and I used to say, I still have like all my old candidates on my mobile, like we, because we were encouraged to save and work that way. Cause that was, you yeah. know, I was sitting there trying to ring through a database. I oh, fuck that. I can WhatsApp someone on the way to a meeting like that. We were very fluid. So, yeah. I mean, I don't use it, but I've still got half the London insurance market on my phone if I wanted yeah. to. Um, <laughs> and I remember thinking, how am I going to get around that? Like, and that's where my content idea came from. It was like, yeah. if I just produce content every day, None of them, everyone can see me. No one can complain. Like, I'm not in, I can't get in trouble for that. Um, well, exactly what we did. So hence why yeah. we did, um, we did a podcast straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that podcast, it was, it was heard and viewed by so many people, which opened up conversations, got candidates to reach out to us. Also got a couple of clients that we now work with, reached out to us off the back of the podcast, but it was purely just having conversations with candidates or, yeah. or clients or people that we knew in the market. Um, there was no kind of financial gain as a result of it. And I think with any restrictive covenant, that's the first thing to consider is, is the are you having a financial gain? You're making a financial gain that should be going to your former employer. If so, you've breached your covenant. Um, yeah. But we acted in, in good faith more than anything. And then beyond that, we looked at it, we read it over again, we had legal advice and we just stayed completely clear of any sort of business relationships with any clients or candidates we had in the past. What was the hardest thing in that first six months? Because, again, I, I'll be honest, I think a lot of people come on this show and they make it sound easy. Like, yeah. and it ain't fucking easy. Like, you, you know, what what do you think was your lowest point? Um, the, the hardest thing is working tirelessly and not seeing any results. Um, because when, you, when you've just left an agency environment where you've built a client list, a candidate list, a pipeline, you, the momentum keeps you going throughout the day and every day you'll get some sort of result. But when you've just started from completely from scratch, it's that momentum when you just think, "What? Where's the motivation?" When I'm not seeing anything, I'll keep working and yeah. not seeing anything. It's like it's like when you just start working out and you say you haven't worked out for a long period of time. You go to the gym for three days and you're like, "I can't see any abs." Of course no. you can't. It takes months, yeah. but to keep going and going when you can't see any results is frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the hardest, one of the hardest things. The, the second hardest things, I'd say, learning how to run a business from an operational perspective. So when you're a, a two person you know outfit to begin with you, you're the it person you're the admin the, the legal the compliance the business development the marketeer the resource you're everything so parts of that i won't get that like it mm. you know having to you know create the system and all that kind of stuff so that was a challenging part to juggle that alongside being a and how did you get on in that how did you get on against that target you set in the first six months uh, we doubled it in six months. Wow. Um, yeah, so we, we, what, we doubled what, what are those numbers? What did you hear? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure, Jermaine. It'll be happy for me to share that information. But it was it was six figures. Um, right. Amazing. Six, 
yeah, so it was enough for us to go, right, we can actually create a function now. So we can hire someone, we can get an office and start building this out, which we planned to do that in year one, like at the end of year one, but we just ended up doing it after six months because the opportunity was there. Um, and restrictions started to, you know, get lifted and things were opening up a bit more. Uh, yeah. Around the- yeah, well, around, around April time, the world, yeah. the world became pretty much back to normal, didn't it? I mean, it yeah. was... It was- very and that was the end of our restrictive covenants. I remember we had a huge party, champagne, everything. We're like, right, we're free. It felt like we're completely free. Um, and you'd already made money and made and made relationships that were going to yeah. probably become good clients anyway, right? It, well, exactly. They were all brand new relationships, which now are actually some of our biggest clients. Um, but yeah, it was just the freedom just to operate how we want. And, so how long did you do the, he was there at five, coffee and start at six or whatever. How long did that last? Uh, we did that up until he caught COVID. <laughs> um, which was, I think, for about three or four months straight. And then Jermaine got COVID, so he was off for like two or three weeks and mm-hmm. working from home. We just caught up over Zoom. Um, and then he came back, and it was just a bit more relaxed than that, a bit more structured, you know, like 7 a.m. starts rather than 5.30. Uh, but, yeah, we did it for the first six months, first six or, or so. And then you went and got an office. Yeah, then we got an office in Hove. Um, well, we had a period of working from home for like, two months completely just me here and yeah. him there um and we hired someone remote and then we got an office and what where how far is the office from where you guys live it's like dead in the middle between both our houses so um yeah, about 15 20 minute drive right cool yeah um and is it all free parking and everything yeah yeah so it is, you know what, that's, yeah, that's the thing that annoys me i've took an office and it's 20 minute walk or five minute drive which is fine but yeah there's no parking so you have to pay every day and it pisses me off like like and and like this morning i'd left my microphone there so i had to run to the office and come back with it to work from home because today i I wanted to work from home so it is that short you can do it but parking's actually really honestly like i'm just saying to anyone who's setting up a business if you if you're not like really close to the office yeah you make sure parkings because it is so annoying every day i'm to pay like it really irritates me I no. almost gave up on the office last week and just can't even notice because I'm like, I'm sick of it. But now I'm like, no, I'm just going to walk. I'm going to run. I'm going to walk. I'm going to use yeah. my legs. Um, Because I'm doing all this running. I'm like, it's like after that, I'm like, fuck it. I just want to drive. But I'm like, no, I'm going to walk. Um, <laughs> and how have you found, how did you find moving into an office after being at home for so long? How did how did that feel? What was the impact on, on you and the team? It was awesome, to be fair. We missed the office environment. You know, it's been almost a year working from home. Uh, and for the latter part of that year, we were completely kind of segregated. So just, yeah. you know, like I said, me here and him there. So having an office environment was good. But, you know, at that point, everything changed with how your know, office and work from home structures were in businesses. And we still wanted to allow hybrid working. So we were only in the office for three days a week. Um, well, right. two and a half days a week. So as a business now, we finish on Fridays at 3 p.m. Yeah. So we're in the office Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So we technically two and a half days a week and then tuesday and thursday work from home but if anyone wants to work from home any longer than that that's fine providing you know they can get on with their work um but being in the office is good it's good when you've got a good team around you um it's definitely still useful you know i'm, I'm still a fan of the office to some extent although i did really enjoy working from home um but yeah that balance was really key our second sponsor is always district four um, District 4 have worked with me, um, or been a partner to this show for a long time, and they are designing designing a business that effectively wants to give recruiters their time back and also allow them to start a business. So do you want to have more time? Do you want to build more money? Do you want to spend more time with family? Do you want longer weekends? Well, all of D4's members have found that. You know, they don't have meetings and commuting and all the unnecessary shite that a lot of recruitment businesses put their teams through, especially when they start and they think they have to keep all of the structure that they've had before. Sometimes for people like you and some, I mean, I'm a bit like that. I like to wake up and just know I can control my destiny on a given day. And District 4 allows you to do that. So if you're somebody who wants to start a recruitment business or has already started and is struggling to scale um, in the way that you want to, not the traditional way, then get in touch via www.justic4.io forward slash hoxo. Check out what they can do. So how, how often are you in there now? And you and the team, how do you balance it at the minute? Yeah, so at the minute, it's three days a week. So 
a lot of us do three days a week and then two days work from home. Uh, some people do two days in the office and three days work from home. Uh, but it's just a mix of both. And is it set days or does anyone do what they want? Well, the set days are Monday, Wednesday and Friday. You know, that's right. where I'm going to be there. That's where most of the team is going to be there. But if someone wants to work from home, like today, we've got someone work from home um, and instead of the office. But we've still got a team there now, um, which I will join straight after this. Right. <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, people think Fridays would be the day you wouldn't want to be. I like going in on a Friday. It's like my yeah. favorite day to get out of the house. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. work from home quite like the midweek the odd like today I'm, i like wednesday at home me so i do yeah. i do monday af monday tuesday afternoon in the office wednesday uh, at morning or i don't bother thursday yeah. i go in the afternoon and friday i go in the morning so i do like half the week pretty yeah. different i don't ever do a full day because i leave the dogs so i come back mm -hmm. and see them um yeah. so when did you start thinking about yeah you said you brought someone in after six months so it was was yeah. the plan always well, the initial six month plan wasn't about hiring. When did you rescope the plan and start thinking, right, we need to bring people on, on board? So we had a hiring plan put in from 12 months onwards. Right. We, you know, bring in one person and then two people every quarter based on right. these quarterly targets to, to grow at pace. Um, we had the budget to bring on, you know, a lot more straight away, but then we wouldn't be able to actually kind of work with them to develop a successful plan. And I knew that's what people wanted. That's what I wanted when I was a consultant someone just to create a bespoke career plan for me and just kind of allow me to work my way through it and then be yeah. successful and get that one-on-one -on -one time with, with the management. So that's why we, we just decided to grow at that pace rather than too quickly, despite the booming market and everything like that. So we brought one person on and then two, two, two every quarter since more or less. What, what are the, what's the demographic of people you're after? Um, what, in terms of who we're hiring at the moment yeah yeah is it graduates are you looking for a second jobbers experience what, what are you going after second jobbers or experience not graduates no. I, you know i'd love to hire graduates right because well many reasons right firstly in terms of being able to help them with the progression of their career you get to kind of mold them without any bad habits and then they yeah. work towards the ingham jones way they're cheap right <laughs> but to, to give a graduate a good opportunity you have to have a learning and development function we don't mm -hmm. We, we don't have an LND manager. We don't have someone that could allow that graduate to go through it. We've only got one graduate in the business. And, you know, we're in two minds about hiring her, but she was incredible. I've right. never seen such like enthusiasm, tenacity and hunger for a role. Wow. We're like, she'll be successful. We, you know, it might take a lot of work, a lot of my time, a lot of Jermaine's time, but she'll be successful. Um, and she has been. She's been promoted twice since she's been here. Wow. Um, but that's the only graduate we've got in the business. Everyone else has got some recruitment experience. So they're aware of what recruitment is. Um, they've recruited in a professional services environment. So it doesn't have to be financial services, you know, tech, pharmacy, or whatever. But just someone who understands what recruitment is and what it entails. Um, what are you, what's you? what been your angle to getting them? Because that that is literally the hardest person to find in our sector. Someone who's got a year or two's experience, who's not necessarily burnt out, but has got enough that you don't have to, like, grassroots them. Yeah. everyone wants that like if I, I could literally find one of them i could spray them around every client i know and, and they take yeah. them right so how are you finding those people because that is that is gold dust yeah um to be honest with you when we tried to find them it was tricky but then when we hired a couple of people we got that we got a few people in after having several conversations uh with with potential candidates but once we got the first couple of people in it was more like word of mouth and just the market just seeing them do well with Ingham Jones, seeing like it's not all just a facade. There is genuine opportunity here. So, you know, most of the people that we have in the business at the moment have progressed once or twice within their first six months, mm. you know? So the opportunity that we give is, is real. Um, you know, you How do you break down what progress. people do? How do you split up the market? Because, you know, there's, it's a big space you operate in. How do you break yeah. down what each consultant can look after? So after three months, um, we've got quite a lot of roles on and it's just trying to figure out what roles are more aligned with what people want to do long term. So having that niche special niche specialism in the back of you know our minds. Um, mm. But then we segregated it by client as well. So clients, I'm passing on clients that, that we have and then the consultants are trying to develop them. So they're owning spaces either by clients and developing existing clients or um, by a niche. So they specialize in climate risk or credit risk or market risk then they'll look after that area but 
within the first three months, it's more just delivering on the clients, understanding what Ingham Jones do, how we do it, and then segregating into one of those two areas, either clients or specialism. Um, right. So that's basically how we're doing it. So gradually, rather than just come in, this is your space, go. Um, yeah. Because yeah. we don't have any 360 consultants. Uh, we just have a delivery function. Um, so who's, yeah. who's the front office? You? Yeah. You do all the business development? Uh, me and Jermaine. Right, yeah. at the moment, yeah. Yeah, at the moment. And I think we're trying, trying to keep it that way for as long as possible. Um, we want people to develop gradually rather than do 360 straight away, do it wrong, or be frustrated with the sales element of the role. But once they're confident billing and really understand the market, then it comes naturally. People don't want to be sold to anymore. So you can't just have that mentality of, oh, we're hire a 360 person, get them on the phone for three hours a day, and they'll win you clients. No, you can't reach people on the phone anymore. So it's not going to work. There's still look, there is still businesses doing it, and I think it will it will get you a result if you do it. But I don't yeah. believe. I don't know. I, I, if you asked me to do that job, I would literally rather pull my own hair out yeah. on the phone than just BD all day. Like it's horrific. But like you say, if you've done really well on in a, in a resourcing re- delivery role, and you genuinely start building really good relationships with ca- with candidates, yeah, it's a different game when you're like introduce the client conversation because you've got all that experience now where i see the challenge is how long before the client becomes this pedestal this challenge this yeah. this like i'm oh I, I you know some people see it as like totally different level it's like they're still human beings they still yeah exactly you know they still need it they still respond to things it's in a similar way so how long do you think you could hold someone in that role before you might they might be scared of business development in the future um that's a good question to be fair i mean I, I don't actually know i think i think when someone comes to you and says i want to do more business development then they know the opportunity to do so will, will be more lucrative for them mm. by whatever structure it is right they'll either get a higher salary they'll get a bonus of new business somehow it'll be more lucrative so when the consultant reaches that period and they're like right i've hit my financial targets every quarter for the last year and a half two years now i want to become a 360 consultant when someone comes to you and says that that's when it's right i think because to present it someone who doesn't want to do it they're not going to do it properly do you know what i mean yeah it's like like the pt i have at the moment he's trying to make me do more sessions my heart's not in it (laughs) i'm not going to do it properly so i need but when i go to him and i say right i want to do more sessions that's when i'll be able to do it well right so that's my choice so to answer that it's, it's when it's their choice um I'm happy to do it. I, I split my day into, into three parts. So I've got I've got the finder hour, the keeper hour, and the doer. So the finder is what I've I'm heard about. It. I've heard other people mention that. Tell I don't I've never actually done that myself. Talk me through that break. Yeah, so it's not all necessarily one hour of each, but it's just going through the day knowing I've had a part of my day where I'm doing that. So in in most part, it's probably a finder hour, a, a keeper hour, and then the rest of the day's doer. Because the rest so of the day what, is... what, what do you I mean? Finder sounds like you're resourcing, but tell me what they they all mean. Break that yeah, down. Yeah, no, Finder is actually it's like new business, finding new business, um, finding opportunities with existing clients. Right. So it's the BD, the finder part, right? So finding work for, for the company. The the keeper hour is more kind of the operational side, keeping the money that we have, um, <laughs> keeping it, growing it, looking at kind of tax, accounting, VAT, finance operations. That's the keeper part of the day. And then the doer is actually delivering on the work that we have. The, the, the retainers going out to find candidates. Um, you know, I still do a lot of the resourcing myself. So that's the doer part of the day. Right. So just trying to think of every day. Have I done one of those? Th- have I done all three? Um, if I haven't, then I need to add an extra hour or two to my day to make sure I do one of the other two. I like that. I've never, yeah, never looked at my day like that. Never looked yeah. at it. I'm going to take that off. Yeah, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> All yours. I'll take it off somewhere else. <laughs> well, mine's a bit different, obviously, because I'm not resourcing, but I do have clients, right? So I've mm-hmm. got I've got to deal with the client base. I've got to support the academy customers and stuff like that. So, yeah, like just before this, I was on a, a call with, so we work with a really cool recruitment business um, who, um, a company called Amoria Bond, who have been, they're in Manchester and all over the world. And they, they've had a really successful first cohort on the academy. So, mm-hmm. We've now got the second cohort because what we encourage people to do now is even if you wanted to put 50 recruiters on, we wouldn't say put all 50 on. Like start with five, 10, get the most engaged people on first, and then we'll each month we'll enroll. So I just did a 
the do a bit, right? Which was getting the, getting them excited for the next cohort and meeting them. And yeah, I love that. I love that. But I've, I've never kind of, yeah, never really thought of ticking those boxes as a, because as an owner of a business, you kind of just get shit done, don't you? Like you just, yeah. you don't know why. I, I, I don't think I, I, I do have a plan each day. Like I'll write down a list of things I want to do each day, but I really like that breaking it into that. But then what about, do you ever fall short on the personal admin stuff? Like, yes, I'm so shit with that. Like, because I'm going to Key West next week. Like, I've had to book COVID tests for the kids and me. I've had to book a, an airport hotel. I've had to think about, um, I had to book the flights and accommodation. Yeah. And then, you know, I've got, I'm, I'm buying a house. I'm selling a house. I'm doing all these different things. I'm like, fuck, it's so much work. And yeah. that's the bit where either it takes too much of my day sometimes. And I'm like, I've, I've not done any work for three mm. hours or, I've, I've completely committed to the job and, I've, and I'm like, I'm missing, I'm not going to get these. Days. I mean, yeah. no, I, I'm with you on that. I, I hate personal admin. Um, yeah. You know, when it, when it's business admin, it's like, it, it's that keeper part of my day. Right. So yeah. I'm like, I have to do it. And it's just yeah. ticking a box, but personal admin, I always put it off. I'm not very good at it. Luckily my wife's brilliant at it. So without her, I probably wouldn't do anything. <laughs> she organizes a lot of the events that we go yeah. to and things yeah. like that. So yeah, I, I I struggle with that, but yeah, I think I'll get better with time. Oh, I'm shit, mate. I'm I'm awful. <laughs> and Lauren ain't much better, really. Like she, she's quite similar because she runs her own beauty salon. She's just as yeah. busy as me. She picks the kids up, gets back. The, nah, we're both probably like, when they're all in bed at eight o'clock. Our fate. We that's when I get my laps out and go. All right, what crap <laughs> have we got to do tonight? It's not fun. Um, so so you got married in November. Yeah. How? No, also, sorry, I got married in July. Uh, July, July. Yeah, no, I keep thinking about it. you got married July last year yeah. so coming up to a year how yeah. I guess how did that affect your life because that again I remember getting married obviously didn't work out but it was in the June of 2019 and again running the business through yeah. that period wasn't easy like there's a lot there's a lot that goes on planning a wedding and you had to be at your and your partner's also getting married so you've your business partner so you've got how, how did that disrupt things um to be fair, it, it for our situation, it wasn't too stressful because we'd already kind of planned the wedding before. Right. We just yeah. had it postponed. So the wedding was actually planned by July 2020. Uh, we got married July 2021. Mm. So that year, we're just trying to pick up the final pieces to, to put it all together. And I say it like I had any part to do with the planning. It was all Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just speaking on her behalf here. Yeah. So she enjoyed that part. She was amazing at it. And she really kind of took over all of it. I mean, I just bought my suit kind of thing. That is yeah. basically yeah. all I did. So wow. it wasn't too stressful for me. <laughs> it was stressful for Chloe, but she managed it and she loved it. And it was okay. And and at that point, to be fair, the, the business was going okay. Like it was we had work taken over and Jermaine took over when I got married, I took over when you got married. So it was fine. It wasn't like, you know, it, the, the tough part of the business. It was the bit when we started to see some momentum, some structure to our day-to-day, -day, um, which was, was good. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't too stressful, really. It was okay. <laughs> you, 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 you strike me as quite a calm guy anyway. You don't, I don't feel like you're going to be Mr. Like roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty chilled. you take things in. and if you've got yeah. a great great wife who can support you then even better right yeah um, exactly. <laughs> what so move into present day you're now mm. at 10 people you've just told me before the show you you basically have maxed out your office mm. if someone would have told you that you'd be here where where you are where you are when you started would you what would you have said i'd be delighted that we you know we got there that quickly um between you and i about saying the arrogant I, I thought we'd always get there just mm -hmm. I thought it would take longer. I thought it would take five, you know, four years, five years, not a year and a half. Um, so yeah, delighted that we managed to get through it at that pace. But still, just taking every quarter at a time. That's what it is. Uh, that quarter, it's trying to get through it, just mentally, you know, financially, physically, to get through it and to hit the target that we set at the beginning of the quarter. And then if we keep doing that, by the end of the year, we should be happy, right? That's the theory of it. Um, but if things go wrong, you take it in your stride, you move on. It's not all going to be easy. We, we're fully aware of that. Um, How do you react when months are going? Because I think when you work for an agency, you feel the stress of the the leadership team when yeah. when things aren't going very well. Yeah, I remember. I remember. I, I I was always going well pretty much until the end, and then in the last year, I had the start of the year. I think what did I have? 
had a 1.4, 1.5 million pound target on my head, on my small desk. And I think I had a team of four or five and two of them left in the first month. One got, one's mum got cancer and the other one, just we just didn't work out. So I went from basically half my team and I'm like, fuck it. So anyway, we, we recruited and we grew again. But in the first, I think three out of three and a half months, I also had a load of legacy contractors that had just been renewing and renewing and they all finished every single bloody one of them. So we did like all the deals we did. Yeah. We did, we had a net growth of zero in I think in three months, three or four months. Yeah. And I remember the pressure I was feeling was, was big. And then, but then when it's come to Hoxo, when we've had bad months and bad quarters, which we have, it's, it's another level. Of, I mm. feel like it's completely different because it's my money. It's my business. It's my responsibility. How, how have you felt in those those times when when things aren't going your way? Um, do you know what it's? You're just revisiting where it's gone wrong and what could be done better. So, there's there was a book that I read a while ago, um, which spoke about an EOS, an entrepreneurial. Operating. Yeah, I know that book, the Traction book. Yeah, Gina Wickman. So, yeah. Gina Wickman's book. It says it all falls into one of six categories, right? You've got people, vision, data, issues, um, traction, and process. Right. So they're the six categories. So when something goes wrong, it's so easy just to panic, to overdo things, to kind of get everyone together and just write, build, 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 deliver, deliver, deliver. But that's not always the case. It's not always just no. bringing in money. It's identifying where where the kind of the gap is in one of those six. Right. And then if it's process, try and sit down and figure out what you can do better. If it's data, you're not really utilizing it enough or, you know, getting enough out of it. Whatever it might be, it could be traction, it could be the people, it could be the vision isn't clear, no one gets it. So identifying where it's gone wrong, sitting down, and that's really the most helpful part um, because it's so easy to just act hastily when you do have a down quarter. You can just go and and you can piss people off, really. And if you piss people off, you're doing even more damage. (laughs) So you want to keep everything right, keep those six plates spinning. Uh, and that's it, really. And it, that's what you know we do whenever you have a down week. Or- I love the traction methodology, the EOS methodology as a business. Yeah, yeah. So we have you got? Yeah. Have you seen traction tools? The technology? Have you used that? No. So traction tools is a piece of tech that we buy, we use, and we run our level ten meetings through it every week. Yeah. So it's built for traction. So it's like it's got your scorecard and your. Oh, nice. Your- I'll send. I'll show you after the session. Yeah. Sorry, people are listening. Like, what are they going on about? <laughs> yeah. It's it's a way of running a business. Small businesses yeah. are chaotic. You follow this methodology, and it, it's great. And it, I remember my first ever uh, episode of the Rag, mm. ever. I talked about. I just finished the book. I just looked at implementing it. And Sam Green from Know It Now, Few and Far, he talked yeah. about the fact he was doing it as well. So All right. um, we still <laughs> run it three years later. We're still running it, and it and it's been implement, instrumental to our business. It's been amazing. It is a great book, to be fair, and it's so clearly put. Um, yeah. And it's really helpful, like you said, for any kind of small business or any entrepreneur starting. It just gives you kind of an alphabet to kind of go by, doesn't it? So Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So where's the future for you guys now? So you sat there at 10. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you, you're in a really cool place, 18 months. You're married. You got that out off your plate. What, what does the future look like for you and Jermaine and the, and the business? Um, I think professionally, Jermaine and I want to continue building the team, um, but we want to do it with everyone in the team progressing. So we want to get everyone up and running. We want to make sure everyone's happy, successful, doing well, and then hiring two, three more people and and following that model. Um, We've set our first kind of two-year target from when our first hire was. For that two year, we said we're never going to hire above anyone. Um, We'll only hire people at consultant level, and then senior consultant and move them up to lead and make sure everyone progresses before we hire someone else. We don't want to just have two people stagnant and then hire a third. That's not going to give them a fair chance to progress. So that was one of the, you know, when, when you put, sit together and put your values, right, you can write any three words on a piece of paper, but one word we really try to stick by, which is one of our values is progressive. We want yeah. to be progressive in our thoughts, in, in the way we structured the team. And we also want everyone in the business to be progressive, you know, whether you're in the operations side or sales side, consultant, you have to progress in some way. And we want to help everyone to do that. So once that's done, we'll just keep doing it. We'll keep growing at that pace. Um, and just it's working so far. So we're not going to do anything drastic. <laughs> um, there's no drastic plans. I know uh, one of the chaps on your podcast before I was listening to Lloyd 
Gordon. Yeah, yeah. He's out in Brighton now, and he's near you guys. He's in Brighton. Yeah, he moved to Brighton like a few weeks ago, which I'm not yeah. too happy about. It's not like I need the competition. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, he's obviously doing really well, and he's making drastic moves. But he's, you know, his business is way further than we are. So yeah. eventually, I'd like to get it to that stage where we do have multiple hubs um, around the UK and potentially an office abroad as well. But it's just doing it at the pace which works for the people in the business, not for minor Jermaine's ambition. Do you enjoy it? Love it. Yeah. Love every part of it, even the struggles. I actually quite like the struggling parts of it. It's quite exciting. <laughs> um, but, isn't it? It's addictive. Yeah, it is. It is addictive. I do enjoy it. I love it. Um, I, I really like recruitment. I like meeting people. You know, I was in London yesterday on meetings, doing the same thing I was doing four or five years ago. I, I still like every part of it. Um, and yeah, I, I like the leadership element of it. I like, you know, creating a team, seeing it do well. And yeah, there's lots I do like about it. I do enjoy it. I don't enjoy it every single day. There are days where it's, you know, you're pulling your hair out, you have struggles, you, you have a tough time with a client or, you know, the downfalls of recruitment, but I've kind of feel like I've built a second layer of skin, <laughs> um, yeah. to protect me from that. What if you were going to. You know, if someone else is sat there now thinking about starting with their mate, because you you've started with a personal friend like I did, yeah. who's also in the industry. What what advice would you give two guys, two girls, whatever that are starting you know, and who've got a personal friendship? How would you? What guidance would you give them? Um, the personal friendship is so valuable uh, because you can be really candid with each other, right? Um, but make sure you're kind of aligned in your thinking you're kind of aligned in your goals and you're both accountable for things so when we first started we both had a list um nada is going to be accountable for this these five things jermaine's going to be accountable for this we'll both dabble and help each other as much as possible but have some accountability because with friends it's hard to have that accountability unless you've got it literally written down so you know when it came to legal when it came to legal and compliance that was my accountability you know creating the contracts doing all that stuff um so it's just aligning where you're going to be accountable to each other that's the way kind of to do it with a friend uh but above all same tip that i heard from one of your podcasts is make sure you've got your partner on board <laughs> yeah. make sure whoever you live with your family or partner they're on board because emotionally and mentally you'll need them more than anything um mm. you know when you're struggling when you've got a mortgage at the end of the month you're, you know, Lauren always says to me, like, you always worry about a target and you always hit it. I'm like, yeah. like why do you keep worrying about it? I'm like, well, that's just who I am. Like, I'll always, I think it's ingrained from recruitment days to yeah. to be so objective driven. And 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 in reality, if you miss a target by like two grand or something in a month, and it's like, you know, does it matter? No. Are you gonna live any different? No. Yeah. And and I'm trying to learn, I'm always trying to unlearn some some habits and be like I'm still happy. I'm still enjoying my life. I'm still, you know, present in the business. And like you said, we're dissecting why and things, but yeah. we are bred in a way that means it's, it's fucking heartbreaking when you miss an arbitrary yeah. number that you've made up. Like it's weird, isn't it? I know it is weird. Um, but I think it's that competitive nature. Hmm. Both Jermaine and I are very competitive. So we want to hit that target. We want to reach it and we'll be so disappointed if we don't get it. But well, like you said, when you sit down and just reflect on it, you're like, well, well, we've done way better than we thought we could do, but we still missed the target, so we were upset a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it is a bad mentality, and I do want to get out of it at one point, to be fair, because long-term, I don't think it's too healthy, actually. But Well, no, uh, if every part of your life was just fixated on a number or a goal and yeah. you weren't happy unless you achieved the goal, then I think it isn't probably that healthy. And yeah. I don't know, there's, there's kind of... You, you, you pointed them out. Lloyd Gordon's of the world, amazing entrepreneurs. Mm. And that guy is growing a beast and he's coming yeah. back on soon. I can't wait. And I've got loads of those types of clients. Yeah, I've got a lot that, you know, some that I've got no ambition to grow headcount, want to just be really profitable and they enjoy it. Others like yourself that are growing at your own pace. I think it's, it's what I love about this industry. It creates different versions of similar product, but a different way of, of doing it. Yeah. My only advice to people from my own experience five years in is, yeah, stick to what you believe is right and, and don't just grow for the sake of growing like everyone else. Don't just yeah. follow the pattern. Don't just be, don't let your ego, because you will. Comparison's the thief of joy. Like, we're all, yeah. I mean, imagine doing this show every week and listening to the numbers that people tell me. I'm like, <laughs> I don't like, I look at my business, I'm thinking, oh, we're nowhere near them. But then yeah. I'm like, but am I happy with my business? Am I happy with what I do? Do I enjoy my life? Am I, am I achieving the things I'm achieving? 
And the answer is yes. So I'm yeah. like, well, I'm winning. Whether I I'm... think between us, we've answered that question. It becomes an issue when you're not happy. So yeah. having a target, which is so stressful to reach, like I'm stressed to reach a target, but I'm happy in, in the journey, right, up to yeah. it. And I'm happy once I hit it and I'm happy after. But at any point during that process, if it started kind of affecting me in a stage where I'm actually quite miserable because I'm so fixated on it, then it's probably wrong. Then you yeah. have to kind of revisit that. It's being aware enough to know, Maybe. being aware enough to know where you are in that process. Yeah, right? I think yeah. so. Yeah, self-awareness is the key there, isn't it? For sure. And I think that's, I don't think you can build anything in life if it's of substantial value if you're not aware of who you are and what you're about. And yeah, that's important, mate. Thank you so much. Nada, we've run out of time, but an hour has just gone so quick. It's unreal. Yeah, I know. Unreal. You should be really proud. I think what what I love about this episode is you. You know, you just really. I think so many people will relate will relate to you. Like you know, you just chilled. Yeah. You relaxed. <laughs> you, you're right in the thick of eighteen months. You've hit ten num. You've hit ten heads. You're doing it in a way that I think sounds. It feels sustainable. I don't know. I don't feel like. I don't think like people are gonna listen and go. You know, mm -hmm. like that seems unrealistic. <laughs> like, if people are decent billers, they're going to be like, Well, why can't I go and do what Nada and Jermaine yeah. have done? You know, obviously, we're on Jermaine's side, and he might be stressed off his nut trying to do it. I don't know, but um, <laughs> I don't, when I didn't meet him, he wasn't. So, uh, <laughs> we'll get you both back on in the future and let's see how the Some let's say how the business evolves if you're up for it. I'd love that. That sounds yeah. great. And if yeah. anyone does want to reach out, if anyone's sitting listening, going, I need to talk to that guy, whether it's to joining and Jones or just to pick your brains on being an entrepreneur, are you open to them reaching out on LinkedIn? hundred percent. Always. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Wicked. So we'll get you back on in the future. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thanks. Cheers, Sean. Thank you as always for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode was brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2000 recruiters right now both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level, individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn and would love to talk to you. Tune in again next week on LinkedIn. I'll see you soon.